Well, by some measures, it's the most popular story of the Bible. Year-round, it is the most ubiquitous or most pervasive or most utilized and referenced story in the Scriptures. You regularly can reference it in the news. You could, In fact, you could Google it and then click on news at the top, which then gives you all this feeds of news, and you will find it today. Without fail, you will find it referenced in court cases or military upsets or political campaigns, and yes, of course, in sports. In the sports world, you can count on it every March Madness and almost every playoff run where the underdog is truly undersized. You heard it referenced with the miracle on ice when USA beat Russia in the Hockey Olympics. You heard it referenced when NC State Wolfpack beat Houston's Fly Salama Jamma in the national championship game. And even if it's not mentioned by name, the story of the underdog drives an enormous percentage of novels and films. And the story from the scriptures that comes to mind, the story from the scriptures that's referenced, the story anytime someone who's too little fights someone who's too big is what? David and Goliath. But they keep using that story, and I do not think it means what they think it means. So the question this morning is, what do you think it means? What do you think David and Goliath is all about? Open your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. And as you're turning there, I do think it's an appropriate place for us to revisit sort of how do we think through biblical narrative. So biblical narrative, in other words, the part of the Bible, which is most of the Bible, it's helpful for us to understand this, most of the Bible is told in story, a narrative. So how do we interpret it? How do we understand that? Because if you are not familiar with the Bible, there are weird things in the Bible. And so when we read of it, is it everything we read of, are we supposed to emulate? Are we supposed to model? Is it a model for us? Are we supposed to mimic? And we come across things like when a man of God, he is, he is rebuked and ridiculed by teenagers. And so what does he do? He calls bears out of the woods, out of the mountains to come down and maul the teenagers. Is that something we're supposed to do? Like, is that a good example for us? Some of you may have tried it. I don't know. When Samuel, just a few weeks ago, hacked Agag to pieces, is that an exhortation for me in my life? When women drive tent pegs through adulterous and scandalous men's foreheads, is, is that for us? When men walk on water, how do we think through this? When Daniel is disobedient, when Daniel is obedient, how do we think through the biblical narrative? Well, I want to give you one heads up, one helpful way as you walk through the Bible to figure out what is going on in a biblical story, and it's simply this. Look for the Lord. Look for the Lord. Look for his actions. Look for how people talk about him. Look how people talk to him. Look for the Lord, or look for Yahweh. Look for when he's not there. His absence is not accidental. If you find a narrative and he's not there, that's screaming at us. Why? But as you study the Bible, one of the most helpful tools when you look at a story in the Scriptures is to look for the Lord. We look at our text this morning, 1 Samuel 17. We've been making our way through this book, which has already taught us so much about the God of Israel, who is the God of the Bible, who is the God of you and me. So we've made our way to chapter 17. If you're new to the scriptures, the big numbers in the Bible are chapter numbers. The little numbers are verse numbers just to help us work through what is a pretty extensive uh, volume of text. So we're in 1 Samuel 17, and it begins, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. Are you tired of the Philistines yet? <laughs> Imagine Israel. How many times does Israel have to look up and say, and now the Philistines have gathered their armies for battle? And then it goes on to tell us where. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in the Ephes Damamin. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up a line of battle against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on one side of the mountain, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Okay, so this is the scene. Israel is about to try and defend their camp. Philistines are on one mountain, they're on the other, and there's a valley in between them. It looks like they're getting ready to clash and go to war. And then verse 4 introduces us. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. 
And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of the spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. This is a pretty impressive individual. Most historians would go with the understanding that this description of him would have Goliath at nine feet, nine inches tall, roughly, give or take an inch. Nine feet. I think once you pass nine feet, nine eight versus nine ten, it's probably not that big of a deal, right? Like when, we, when you hover around six feet tall and you're a little below or a little above, you, that, there's an inch is an important feature, isn't it? Not when you're nine nine. Nope, it doesn't matter. Nine feet, nine inches tall. And then it goes on to tell us about his armor. Why? Because I want you to understand, this is building up for an impressive man. His armor, and if you probably have a Bible with footnotes in it or a text or a study Bible, it'll probably tell you his armor was 125 pounds. So he was carrying on his frame 125 pounds. The spearhead alone from this spear that the, the shaft of it is described like a beam, the spear alone was 25 pounds. So to put that in a little bit of context, for those of you in here who have ever bow hunted, you understand this, that even if you shoot a really heavy arrow, the arrowhead is less than one-tenth of a pound. And here this guy is prepared to sling, not to shoot, but to sling a spear that has as the arrowhead of it 25 pounds. You see, this should start to be familiar to you. Guys, when something or someone, especially on the other side of Israel and the other side of God, is being posed as impressive, you should sit back and smile and just say, hey, watch, this is going to get bigger and bigger. Because what do we said? God stacks the team against himself over and over, and he always makes it outlandish. We see examples from that, from uh, you know, Gideon's army. The, the numbers are just disproportional. Or you find even when Elijah's going up against the, the prophets of Baal. Is it a fair contest? No, it's not a fair contest. It's not two equal altars that are both dry. And what does God do? No, he douses his and he makes it almost, he makes it, well, almost, he makes it impossible to fathom. Right, because God sets the stage. He stacks the team against himself. So when you see this building up, you should start to smile. Of course, Goliath is nine feet, nine inches tall. Of course, his armor weighs most than anybody, like, you know, in our youth group, save a couple, right? We've got some big old fellas, all right? Got some football players in our youth group, right? But, I mean, his armor weighs more than people. Of course, this is presenting him as insurmountable foe. He's given the title of champion. Of course he's champion. He's undefeated. He's not lost to anyone. And there's a reason why he walks before verses 8 through 10 tell us. The shield bearer was before him, and he stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Now, he pause right here. He says, Am I not a Philistine? The text actually probably better transposed, Am I not the Philistine? And I don't think anyone argued with him. You know? Like, if you walked around and you said, am I not the American? There'd be people that would fight you. If you were nine feet tall and a warrior that had never been defeated and you walked around and you were like, I am Captain America, people would probably go, yeah, you, yeah, okay. I'm not going to argue with that one, right? He said, I am the Philistine. And so what is proposed? Verse Eight, choose for a man yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Right, so they've set up the stage. So instead of lots of bloodshed, it's just gonna be one-on-one. You present your best man, we'll present our best man, and the winner will reign over all. Well, you can understand the next verse. It makes sense. It's both disappointing and yet understandable Very, well, excuse me verse 10 first and the Philistine said I defy the ranks of Israel this day give me a man that we may fight together and then verse 11 when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines they were dismayed and greatly afraid you see I say it's understandable because it's understandable that you would feel like we have no hope Goliath's presence alone would serve as just this unbeatable force. And so 
It's understandable that they would be dismayed and greatly afraid, and yet it's also disappointing because they should know by this point that it is not the size of the person in the fight. It's interesting that Goliath's height is so highly presented here. It's, it's right from the very get-go. He's nine feet, nine inches tall. In the chapter right before, what did the Lord say? Do not look at the appearance or the height of a man. That's not coincidental. Don't look at the height of a man. Let me test you. I'm going to give you the height of a man in all its glory. But they did what God called them not to do. They looked at the height of a man, and they were greatly afraid. Now, the author feels this tension, and so, helpfully, he gives us a little bit of relief. So here is Goliath standing there. Everyone's afraid. Everyone's dismayed. And now there's a little bit of a a break, and it says this, Now David. (laughs) Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse. Just a little bit of a referral to us or a reminder to us back to what we had learned just in the last couple of weeks. He was the son of a man who had eight sons, and we know that David was the youngest. This was in the days of Saul. The man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul into battle. And the names of these three sons who, were to be, who went to battle with him were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and next to him, the third, Shammah. We have been introduced to those. Remember when Jesse was told he's going to have we need one of your sons. One of your sons is going to be anointed king. And so he rolls through all the list of his sons. And these were the first three that were put forward because these were the three oldest. These were the three that made the most sense. So we'd already been introduced to them. Verse 14 reminds us, though, there was an eighth son. Verse 14, David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistines came forward and the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So we have this glimpse. So here is David. David is going back and forth. We're going to see him sort of like DoorDash. David's running food back and forth to the front lines from Jesse and his farm to the front lines. He's going to take all kinds of stuff to them. And in the middle of this, so this gives you this picture. And why? Because it's supposed to build for 40 days. Can you imagine for 40 days, every morning Goliath comes out and he says this, he, he lays down, he throws down the gauntlet, he lays down these words of derision against Yahweh, derision against Yahweh's people, and everyone just lives in fear for 40 days. Verse 17 takes us back to David's occupation during this time, and, Jesus, and Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commanders of thousands. It's interesting. Don't know why the commanders of thousands. They got cheese. Lots of ten cheeses. Who knows? All right. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. So as any father would want to do, he would want to know how his sons are doing when they're off at war. And so he tells them, here's the stuff you're supposed to deliver. Here's the food you're supposed to deliver. And I want to know how are the sons doing. So verse 19. Then now Saul and they that is this brothers, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now, when it says this, I think we're still to envision that they're still just on the mountain. So fighting is a more broad general term that they're still at war. But there's not a lot of engagement that's going on here, right? Because the engagement is intended to be Goliath and one of the Israelites. Verse 20, and David rose early in the morning and he left the sheep with the keeper and he took the provisions and he went as Jesse had commanded him. That's gonna be a phrase that regularly follows David supposed to know that we're supposed to see that he is obeying and he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry and israel and the philistines drew up for battle army against army again they are lined up as if to do battle because they don't have anyone to present for to battle goliath and david left the thing the little things excuse me david left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers and as he talked with them behold the champion the philistine of gath goliath by name came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. So it's like clockwork. Every morning, Goliath gets up, he gets dressed, puts on his arm, and he rolls out, and he makes this announcement. The only thing different about today that had happened in the last 40 days is David heard him. No, this wasn't, it's not our day. In our day, everybody would have known. Jesse would have known what Goliath said because it had been tweeted, right? 
hadn't gone viral yet. So David's sitting there. He's talking to his brothers. All of a sudden, this mammoth mountain of a man comes across the valley. He sees, and everyone hears him bellow. And this time, David hears it. So scary even is the sound and, and what goes behind the sound, meaning the, the inference of Goliath and his intimidation. Verse 24, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's coming to defy Israel and the king will enrich the man who kills him with greater riches and will gather him and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So everybody's looking for someone. Now, I don't think they said this to David because David came up and he looked like a reasonable opponent. But maybe David, on his DoorDash route, would know someone, could find someone. Maybe there's a 10-foot-tall Israelite somewhere. If you could just find him, here's the good news. If you do this, you're going to get all kinds of glory. You get to marry into royalty. You get to have riches beyond your wildest imagination. If only someone will step forward. Verse 26 David said, let me pause right here. This is the first time uh, that we're going to have David speak. Take note of it. Doesn't mean he hasn't spoken before, but it is the first time we have him speaking in Scripture. And he says this to the men who stood by him. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Now, pause right there. When you, when you ask that question, if you pause and you don't let him finish, you would think, well, David is pretty interested in this sort of monetary reward. Remind me again. What did you say? What did you say you get if you beat Goliath? And before they can answer, he says this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Friends, there might not be a better rhetorical question in all of Scripture that wasn't voiced by Jesus himself. I want you to feel the weight of this question. Because again, we're not talking about someone who sees Goliath and goes, huh, ah, we got a shot. I've got, I've got an idea. We see someone who sees Goliath and is offended by his very presence. The audacity that Goliath would stand there and defy God bothers David so badly that he asks this rhetorical question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, why did he put that preference there? Everybody knows that a Philistine is uncircumcised. That seems redundant. Why? Because circumcision was the mark of God's people. So what he's saying is not some sort of biological thing. It's not some sort of beef he had with the doctor that delivered the baby. I know the doctor probably didn't deliver a baby back then, but whatever. It's not the circumcision. It's what? It's what it signifies. This is not one of God's children, and he is, he is casting all kinds of dispersions on God's people. He is defying the living God. In fact, he says he defies the armies of the living God. Friends, the armies are not what is, what is important in that sentence. It's the fact that they are the armies of the living God, which we need to understand. Our God is living. He is active. We'll come back to that. He does not sit idly by. He moves. He responds. He engages. He is sovereign. And David knows this. He knows that there's a sovereign God being mocked. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the living God? Verse 27, the people answer him in the same way. So they say, hey, here's what happens. If you can find somebody, so it shall be done to the man who kills him. They're not hopeful. They're not hopeful that there's tucked away somewhere. They're just trying anything. If you know someone, please tell them. Verse 28. Now Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. He heard what David said. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. You pause right there. Oh, big brother, little brother. Yeah, they, they get in fights sometimes, don't they? And Eliab was hot. Why was he hot? Why was he angry? Because his younger brother was being foolish. He was being foolish, and when you're a younger brother and you're foolish, you make your older brother look foolish. Don't do that. Stop. Stop acting that way. You're making us look bad. Which David's thinking, I'm not making us look bad. Goliath's making us look bad. Y'all are making us look bad. But Eliab's hot. Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Is that really your big concern? 
You even mentioned that there were a few sheep. Are you really worried about that? And then what does he say? Look, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. For you've come down to see the battle. So he's assuming in David all kinds of motives here. Number one, he's assuming that he cares more about the thrill of the battle to watch it than he does doing his own deeds and obedience as part of the family. And he also sees David looking at some kind of glory. He's trying to find some kind of glory. And so he doesn't see, just like we can't see, truly and purely into the heart of man, neither could Eliab. Eliab couldn't see his own heart, much less David's. But he says it anyway, I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And David said, because this is an older brother, younger brother battle, so it's not over here, right? So younger brother pipes back up. What have I done now? <laughs> That's such a classic line. What have I done now? What have I done? What have I done to deserve this? And then what does he say? Was it not but a word? All I did was say something. Was it not a word? It was a word. And that word made its way up to Saul. Look at verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. Why? No one else was speaking this way. Do you understand that? Why would you send David, this diminutive youth, why would you send him to Saul? Because he's the only one who's talking this way. He's the only one who's optimistic. He's the only one who's hopeful. He's the only one who seems to have something against Goliath. So they calls for him. Verse 32, and David said to Saul, I love this. Please understand here, there's a setting going on in this. This is probably the least appreciated part of the story, and it's one of the places where our attention should be drawn. David, this little youth, was brought before the king of Israel, and David takes over the meeting. It doesn't even show Saul asking any questions, does it? That's for a reason, right? This story was written by the Holy Spirit to, give, to, to depict things, it's not just a historical account. It is to show us things. What's it showing? It's showing David taking command when who should have been taking command? Saul. No. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Whew. Look at the two features that he puts before you. Number one, let no one's heart fail because of Goliath. Friends, this is the number one command. We talk about it all through the scriptures. The number one command through the scriptures is do not fear. Do not fear. And we're told to do not fear things that, apart from God, we should be afraid of. We should fear death. We should fear sickness. We should fear other people. We should fear Goliath apart from God. But the scripture tells us you're not apart from God unless you live like the fool in Ecclesiastes who lives under the sun as if there's nothing above the sun. But if you know who orchestrates all things you have no reason to fear if you submit to god and follow him you have no reason to fear not the storm not the pharaoh not goliath not your doctor's account not your bank account you have no reason to fear and david says this to the king let nobody's heart fail because of goliath and then notice the framing your servant We'll go and fight for you. Friends, we're going to come back to this at the end because I want you to understand a king taking the role of a servant going in the place of sinful men. David says to Saul, I got this. Now, I with a little I. We'll come back to it in a minute. What does Saul say? Verse 33. You're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, but you're about a youth. And he's been a man of war from his youth, meaning he's been fighting and killing people since before you were born. What do you think? What do you think you're going to do? I want you to understand that both Eliab and Saul are like the first battle round. They're like small Goliaths for David. They oppose him, just like Goliath does. They oppose him, and they think he's too small, they think he's insufficient. And so David has to go through several battles before he even gets to Goliath. Here, he offers to do what Saul should be doing, and he scoffs at him. How does David respond? Verse 34. 
But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And then when they're, like maybe he just retired. I don't know, because he said used to. I don't know. But anyway, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the, lock, from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. And every man in this room goes, amen. Like That is just fantastic, right? Took sheep from my father and you ran off and I tracked you down and I grabbed you by your beard and I beat you until I got the lamb back. That is exciting. But I love this. But before we get all excited about our own masculinity here, David's going to teach us a lesson, right? Verse 36, your servant has struck down both lions and bears and tigers, oh my, and the uncircumcised Philistines shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. So he's built up his resume. I've beat things like this before, and I will beat things like this again. Why? Because he defies the living God. Now, here's the kicker, verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David wasn't proud of his own biceps. He wasn't proud of his ability to tangle. He knew that everything behind his success was the living God of Israel. He knew that it was God and God alone that brought him victory. He knew it was God and God alone who provided him strength. And yet he knew this. God, you have demonstrated time and time again that when you and I rely on your strength, I will not be defeated. This is such a great lesson. He took the faithfulness of God from the past and he put it into his hope for the future. That's what we're to do. That's the whole thing about Ebenezer's and building up a catalog of what God has done in your life in the past so that when you face something, and I'm, we're going to be careful here because the world's going to go, and sadly the church is often going to go, oh, here comes your Goliath. And we want to go, oh, okay, well now they're getting sideways with this understanding. No, there is a real sense. You need to understand that your battles are like Goliath's. But the answer to this is not for you to understand that David's beat Goliath. You don't get there and go, I've got my hope in the little guy. No, you go, I've got my hope in the big guy. I got my hope in the guy who created all things. I've got my hope in God. David looked back at his past and God's faithfulness to give him hope for the future. Friends, we must look at the faithfulness of God in our past to give us strength for the future. That's how he's designed it. And he has proven himself faithful and faithful and faithful. I've heard your testimonies. I've heard you talk about times where God showed up that, and I say God showed up, I don't even like that language. But you know what I'm saying by that, right? When it was conspicuous that God was doing something that you could not do. You've testified to that. Testify to others. Testify to yourself when you're facing challenges. We use the faithfulness of God in the past to give us strength for the future because God doesn't change. And David knew God doesn't change. And so he looked at Saul and said, Saul, God's been faithful to me in the past and will be faithful to me in the future. Well, Saul concedes. I think he concedes really because he doesn't have any other choice. Saul said, Do, go, David, and Lord, the Lord be with you. Verse 38. And here I want you to see something. Another, this is usually passed over, and we want to get down to the action. Don't miss this. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, and he clothed him with a coat of mail. This is a level of shame that Saul doesn't see, but should have brought him to his knees. Why does he put Saul's armor on him? Because God is showing Saul this should have been you. This is an indictment on Saul and on all of Israel. David should not be the one wearing this armor. This should be Saul. Saul, you are the king. You should be wearing the king's armor, and you should be going out there and saying, don't let your hearts fail, for the Lord will give us victory. But he's not. And so even though God knows, and David knows, when he puts on this armor, this stuff's not going to fit. All right, but you give me this armor. I'll put it on. I'll try it. Everybody knows it's not going to work, but God does it, and he includes it in this so that it can be such shame brought on Saul for not doing what he's supposed to do. David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go. And there's a little bit of comedy here, isn't it? He can't even really walk. He's like, look, you're going to send me out against Goliath. 
I know God's going to save me. I don't know how God's going to save me, but it's not going to be me tripping over this armor and falling down. That's not going to be helpful. So he says, I cannot go out with these, for I've not tested them. And basically meaning not only have not tested them, I can't figure out how to even use them because they're so oversized. So David put them off. And David picked up what he did know. He took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. Now again, guys, we need to understand this. God saves and he saves using human means. We don't sit back. We're never commanded to let go and let God. That's a stupid phrase. We're told to strive and let God. We're told to give everything we possibly have and then know it's laughable and watch God work. Give everything you have, run as hard as you possibly can, knowing you're way too slow, you're way too out of shape, you're way too weak, and you give everything you have and you watch God do his work. That's what David does. He doesn't sit back and sit there and go, okay, well, something lightning's going to strike Goliath. No. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. I know God can, he can save with many or with few. I don't know how he's going to do it, which is also why he picks up how many stones? Five. David hadn't been given a vision from the Lord on how this was going to go down. Do you understand that? In fact, there's a sense in which David's going, I don't know. I don't know if I'll really win this battle the way that I think I'm going to win this battle. I might win this battle. I might die, and I might encourage everyone else. Goliath's going to come down. I know that because God's not going to stand for his name to be like this. But I certainly don't know that I'm going to knock him down on the first one. So I'm going to take backup. He takes five stones. Five stones are probably about the size of an egg to a baseball. And if you've ever watched, uh, Mike sent me a video. I haven't seen it before. If you've ever watched how these slings work, uh, there's estimations of people, depending on the size of the stone you use, you can go from 70 miles an hour to over 100 miles an hour that they can launch these things with incredible accuracy. But again, so David's going to give his best. He's going to sling his most accurate. He's going to try to hit Goliath between the forehead, or between the forehead, in the forehead, between the eyes. He's going to do his best. And he's got lots of practice, and he's got lots of skill that God has given him, experience and opportunity that God has given him. And yet, friends, let's, let's be clear on this. That stone sailed on sovereign winds and landed exactly where it needed to. Let's read the account of it. So David comes down. And as he's coming down, the Philistine looks at David, and he has disdain for him. Youthful, ruddy. It is interesting that he puts enhancement in appearance. David gets a shout out for his looks here. It's, I appreciate that. In the middle of this. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but it's like the Philistine notice. Hey, you're a good looking guy. You're little, but you're good looking. And the Philistine said to him, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And he cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, I love this. I love this. This is the kind of thing you see when martyrs were burned at the stake. If you read the testimony, Fox's Book of Martyrs, martyrs burned at the stake. Not all of them, right? Because we have different measures of faith where we, where we grow in, in our faith. But the ones that have grown in their faith, they walk into things like this, and they don't just simply go, all right, I'm tired of the stake, but I'm gonna, and I'm weeping, and I'm scared, and all that. There's a, there's a faith that walks right into the midst of the fire without fear. This is David. What does he say? Verse 45. And I really think this, this is the heart. 45 and 46 is the heart of this text. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies... And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is what? A God in Israel. This is the painful thing. For 40 days, Israel's been acting like there is no God in Israel. I, and that that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. Pause. He doesn't mean by that the Lord doesn't save with sword and spear. His favorite piece of equipment is a sling. He doesn't say it. What does he mean? He saves by his own power. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And obviously, you know the rest of the story. 
David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face to the ground. That's the shortest, most nondescript way of describing all this, right? Everything that we talk about is around these couple of verses. But notice, this isn't the priority. Yes, that's how it all comes together, but the priority is the faith in a God who is bigger than Goliath. The faith in a God who is bigger than anything we could ever face. Read a good bit of the Battle Hymn of the Republic this week. Spent a lot, I spent some time going through the lyrics of it. It has an interesting history and current context, right? The hymn was actually written, if you're not familiar with it, was actually written by an abolitionist poet. Julia Howe wrote this at the behest of a pastor. She kind of came up on a, another hymn. He said, I don't really like the words of this. It doesn't have, it's, it's not, can you, can you rewrite? Can you come up with something? And what's interesting, and in several articles that I read, secular articles about this hymn that I read, words like these were found. Like this was the common refrain about this hymn. One is, and I'm quoting this from the Atlantic in 2010. The battle hymn is not just a thread woven into the national fabric, and it's not just a consecrated text that we reach for in times of trauma. It's also a mirror of the United States. The words of the battle hymn capture something deep in American experience of war. For 150 years, Americans have seen military campaigns as a righteous quest to smite tyrants and spread freedom. Are we being called to war? <laughs> now listen to this. The battle hymn is our way of war. The battle hymn is how we fight. <laughs> this is how we fight. Is it? Have you read it? Listen. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening's dew and damps. I have read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. I have read a fiery gospel writ in burnished rows of steel. And ye deal with my condemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. O oh, be swift, my soul, to answer. O oh, be jubilant, my feet. Now listen to this. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. His truth is marching on. So you can see in that line that there was a, there was a, a posture towards the freedom of man in the days of the Civil War. But what you must concede about this hymn is this is not how men fight. This is not some patriotic tune to this is how Americans fight. This is a tune that says this is God and he will trample out and he will conquer and he will bring judgment and he will bring wrath and he also will bring one who will crush evil's head, his servant. And he died to make men holy. Friends, we march and he moves. We sling and he's sovereign. We act and it's in his power and because of that because of that very thing we have no reason to fear none there is nothing that can threaten us there is nothing on this earth that can bring anything into our life that should cause us to worry or have an anxiety or fear we have god to lean on we trust in the same god that made goliath laughable in the eyes of david we trust in the same God who calms the seas. We trust in the same God who causes the dead to rise again. Friends, we are, regularly, um, we are regularly threatened by the culture to make God smaller, and the Bible's regularly showing us he's bigger than we ever imagined. And that's what we have here. The, this story should be called, I don't know, Goliath and David's God. Not David and Goliath. David would laugh, like scornfully laugh at us if he thought that we would think that this is about him and that somehow 
Some of us who are shorter than others of us would take great courage in the fact that little people can succeed. It's nothing like that. It is about the God of David and the God of Goliath, and our hope needs to be in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us grace today, that you would give us grace to see what David saw, that you would give us grace to see what Elijah's servant saw when he said, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the heavens were filled with your army. Let us see through your word that we are not outnumbered. Let us see through your word that we are not overmatched. Let us see through your word that it is not our power and our strength, but it is yours and yours alone. Lord, may we rest. May our working be restful working. May our labor be labors of love because we know that you and you alone fight our battles. God, give us strength. For those who are weary in here, strengthen hearts. For those who are afraid in here, encourage hearts. For those who are arrogant in here, humble us to know that it is you and you alone who has power. It's you and you alone who's worthy of all glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.